Hi, I'm Teresa Marie Ryan, and today we're going to talk about applying color theory to digital media and visualization. In this tutorial, we will highlight five topics. Additive and subtractive color models, defining color gamut spaces and systems, selected artistic movements related to color theory, case studies pertaining to colorizing visualizations, and finally, hands-on workshop using online and mobile color tools. First, let's start our tutorial with a review of additive and subtractive color models. We will review red, green, blue, adding colors with light as seen on our color display monitors and digital cameras, cyan, magenta, yellow, and key black, subtracting colors with ink as seen from high resolution printouts and our local printing devices, red, yellow, and blue, subtracting color paints, colors with paint when we use a real paintbrush, crayons, or markers. So let's talk about red, green, and blue RGB, the additive color model of lights. As we look in the center of this diagram, we see red, green, and blue coming together to form white light. If we look a little bit closer, we see there's also cyan, magenta, and yellow. So notice there is a reciprocal relationship with the red, green, and blue additive color model of lights and the cyan, magenta, and yellow subtractive color model for printing. So again, we're going to look at cyan, magenta, yellow, and key black. Key black is added to support the printing of text. This is a subtractive color model for printing. If we look in the center, the center shows black. Surrounding it is red, green, and blue. So these two models are reversely related to one another. Now let's look at red, yellow, and blue. This is the painter subtractive color model. Again, if we look in the center, we see a sort of brownish black tone. And our secondary colors become orange, green, and purple. These are the colors that result from mixing the primary colors of red, yellow, and blue together. The painter subtractive color model is used by interior designers in designing spaces, architectural spaces, and it is, has been used for centuries by painters and artists. Let's visually summarize the three color models we've covered. RGB, red, yellow, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow, key black. RGB adds with lights, CMYK subtracts for printing, RYB subtracts to mix paints. Sometimes other color models are developed to support specific output devices. At one time there was a hexachrome, a six color printing process that combines cyan, magenta, yellow, key black, orange, and green. This is because the creation of orange and green was muddy with just cyan, magenta, and yellow. Here we show an example of a CMYKOG process. Printed, this is a visualization I did in the 1980s on the Lisa computer, which was a precursor to the Apple Macintosh. Next, we define some color terminology. We will cover color model and color gamut equals color space. The International Commission on Illumination Color Space, CIE XYZ. The Munsell Color System. 
Pantone color matching, web colors, hex triplets, hue, saturation, and value developed in the computer graphics community, and the color wheel and color schemes. Color gamut is the subset of colors that can be accurately represented in a given circumstance. For our situation, we will look at a horseshoe. This is the gray part of our diagram that we see inside a triangle. This triangle is the color gamut of a typical computer monitor. The grayed out portion or the horseshoe represents the entire range of color. Each output device or display device has its own color gamut with inside this horseshoe range. So we have a color gamut and a color model. A color model, for example, let's look at red, green, blue, and let's look at a series of color models associated with that space. Matte paper, if we look at the entire range of a uh, color range of a matte paper, we can create a color model just like the circle zone that we show here. sRGB is a standard that was developed <clears throat> by Hewlett Packard and Microsoft and is probably the most common standard of the RG model implemented today. It is on smartphones and other devices. Adobe RGB is a RGB model that has a broader color range was developed to address desktop publishing as well as Adobe's creative suite and um, creation of digital media with Adobe products. ProPhoto RGB was developed by Kodak to address digital photography. You can see ProPhoto RGB has probably the largest range of color. Now let's compare RGB and cyan, magenta, yellow, and key black color spaces. Very often, one can select a color in RGB, specifically in the pink or magenta tones and the green tones. And when it is printed out in CMYK color space, very often that same color does not result. It looks different. This diagram shows the fact that the two color spaces selecting colors in one can produce different results when it's transferred to the other. Let's do some real world comparisons of color spaces. A long while ago, I did some experiments with color photography versus paper collage. I used one of the highest forms of color photography that's now called Iphochrome. Back then it was called Cibachrome. Here we have an example of a paper collage with a very cyan blue tone to it. And as you can see, when it is transferred into film and printed out as a photograph, that cyan moves into a green tone. On your left, you see an example of something that began with an orange background, and that orange background transfers pretty well into the Eiffel Chrome. However, notice that the purple tones or the lavender tones do not transfer as well. Here we're going to look at two other examples. This is the example of that hexachrome printout in, in paper form transferred into photography and you'll see the colors are more muted. Another example of a printout of magent with a magenta background and notice how the photography is much more subdued. There are a number of color resources, uh, resources on color management. One of the pioneers in color management was Bruce Frazier, and he wrote a book called Real World Color Management. This book is available in its second edition. It is a powerful book for trying to understand how to transfer between different media and manage, manage 
the um, color changes resulting from that. Frazier also authored another book with others called Real World Image Sharpening with Adobe Photoshop, Camera Raw, and Lightroom, second edition. There is also a very good color management website, colormanagement.com, that allows you to see the latest trends and how to transfer between media. Now let's talk about the International Commission on Illuminations CIE XYZ color space. <clears throat> this color space was originally developed in 1931 by David Wright and John Gilt's experiments in the 1920s. They conducted a series of perception studies and this resulted in their development of this color space. Now, if we look carefully at it, we'll see it's heavy on the green side. A lot of green tones are in it. We have a minimal amount of orange tones if we examine it more carefully. Now, it was shown that this particular CIE 1931 color space was shown to have limitations with regards to expressing lightness, purity, and dominant wavelength between colors. There was also an issue of perceptual uniformity in color spacing. In the 1970s, work began to develop other standards to replace CIE 1931. In 1976, CIE evolved two standards, love and lab. lab. So you either love it or you lab it. The love standard is designed as a simple to compute transformation to, from the 1931 standard to address perceptual uniformity. L, U, and V are calculated from chromaticity coordinates, coordinates. It's well suited for computer graphics and digital display. It's covered in computer graphics principles and practice in C. This would be the Foley, Van Dan, Finer, and Hughes with CIE lab, L equals a lightness coordinate, A is a red-green coordinate, and B is a yellow-blue coordinate. The lab standard is very well suited for high-end printing and other digital media transfers between RGB and CMYK. Hoffman provides an excellent discussion on CIE lab and how it has evolved. Lab is CIE lab is closely related to the Munsell system. Now let's talk about the Munsell system. It's a hue value and chroma color space. It was developed in the late 1890s. It consists of five principal hues, red, yellow, green, blue, and purple with intermediate hues halfway between each principle. So my favorite color, orange, is not actually considered a, a five-principle hue in the Munsell system. That is actually an immediate, intermediate hue called yellow-red. Each of these 10 steps is divided into 10 subsets to yield 100 hues with integer values. Black, the value zero at the bottom to white at the top, is the next element of the color Munsell system. Now, chroma is measured radially from the center of each slice. So what is Munsell after in developing this color system? He's after developing something like a 3D beach ball. He wants to create a color system that is like a three-dimensional sphere where you can have all your hues displayed across in that, in that three-dimensional space with value, hue, and chroma. Lower chroma values are less pure and more washed out like a, like a pastel. So this is Munsell's goal.
And now let's see what really happened when this was measured. It turns out that Munsell was unable to get a perceptually uniform sphere. He also tried to go after other 3D surfaces. Came to the conclusion that it was not possible to develop a 3D perceptually uniform color system. However, in 1929, the Munsell Book of Color defined the fundamentals of the color space configuration that he developed. Now, in the graphic design community, another color matching system is evolved, and that's called the Pantone color matching system. It standardizes colors. It has been based on a formula guide. where there are 1,114 colors specified by their allocated number, such as PMS, Pantone Matching System 130. The colors are based on 15 pigments, 13 base color pigments, along with black and white, and they are mixed in various amounts. This particular approach, the Pantone Color Matching System, standardizes CMYK color printing. Basically, you say to a printer, my color, the color for my logo is PMS 130. The printer goes and looks up the PMS 130 value and the formula guide and prints according to that value. So CMYK Printing effectively reproduces a special subset of the Pantone colors. Now, Pantone has since moved into the digital arena, has an online website, and has also developed a Pantone app, My Pantone app, that you can put on your smartphone or other mobile digital device. Now, one has to be careful because we talked about this that your mobile device is an RGB system. So you're looking at your Pantone color, color in RGB space, but you're going to print in CMYK space. So now let's talk about web colors, hex triplets, that the World Wide Web Consortium developed to support color on the web. This is a six-digit, three-byte hexadecimal number used for HTML, CSS, and SVG, as well as other web applications to represent colors. A byte, a number in the range of 0 to FF, is hexadecimal notation, or 0 to 255 in decimal notation. The bytes represent red, green, blue components of color, RGB. Byte 1 is the red value. Byte 2 is the green value. Byte 3 is the blue value. If any one of the three color values is less than 10 hex or 16 decimal, it must be represented with a zero so that the triplet always has six digits. When you develop web pages, you specify these hex triplets and to determine the colors that you want displayed. In the computer graphics community in the 1970s, as the, C color for, as the CIE 1931 standard was going under review, there was a huge saturation and value standard also developed. These concepts were presented first by Alvy Ray Smith at SIGGRAPH in 1978. He developed a paper called Color Gamut Transform Pairs. And here's the URL to getting to the actual paper. With HSV, Hugh defines a particular color selection in terms of wavelength dimensions. Saturation refers to the dominance of hue in color ranges from pure to desaturated. 
value is expressed in terms of lightness or darkness of a given color, color overall intensity of the spectral light. HSV is expressed as a 3D cone where color hue values are strongest at the outer edge and become desaturated when moving towards the linear, central linear axis. Now let's talk about the color wheel and how you arrange color hues around the circle. The first color wheel was actually developed by Isaac Newton. He was looking at the RGB space. So he developed a set of primary colors, a triangle relationship, a triad, to, make a, to usefully arrange the colors. So he did it with red, green, and blue. Others have taken the concept and shown cyan, magenta, and yellow, or red, yellow, and blue can also develop the same triad and form a color wheel. Then secondary colors were added by producing the mixing of the primary colors. So for RGB, this is going to result in yellow, cyan, magenta. For cyan, magenta, yellow, this is going to be result in blue, green, red as the secondary colors. For ye red, yellow, blue space, this is going to be orange, green, and purple. Then the color wheel is divided into smaller and smaller fractions. So you get yellow, green, orange, red, purple, magenta, as you finally, finally um, divide the pieces of pie in the color wheel. Complementary colors are colors opposite each other on the color wheel. So that would be yellow and violet, or red and green, or red and cyan, and green is cyan. Now let's use the color wheel to build color schemes. Monochromatic deals with different tints or shades of one color. Analogous are colors adjacent to each other on the color wheel. So analogous colors would be yellow, orange, yellow, orange, and orange, red. Split analogous is a main color and the two colors one space away from each other on the, on, on the color wheel. So we talked about yellow and violet for a split for, um, excuse me, um, for a split analogous we talked about yellow, orange, yellow, orange, and orange, red. So if we had yellow, a split analogous would be orange, and yellow green on, in our particular color wheel example. Complementary colors are each opposite on the color wheel. And split complementary is one main color and two colors on each side of its complementary color. So this again would this would be the yellow example with blue violet and purple violet serving as a split complementary color scheme. Triadic are three colors equally spaced on the color wheel, and that's our red, yellow, blue for painter's colors, RGB, red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow. All of these are our triadic colors. Tetradic are any four colors with a logical relationship on their color wheel, such as two complementary pairs. So for our case, this could be yellow and violet, and turquoise and scarlet. We will highlight some others in our hands-on session.
Now let's examine some selected artistic movements pertaining to color theory. Pointillism, Fauvism, color field painting, and the Bauhaus teachings of color theory. There are many others. These are the ones we'll discuss in this lecture today. Pointillism is about building an image from separate dots of paint. George Surratt developed this concept in 1886 in his paintings. It was an outgrowth of Impressionism, and it relies on the eye and the mind of the viewer to compose the color dots into a broader range of tones. As st stated before, it's an outgrowth of the Impressionistic art movement noted for visible brush strokes and an emphasis on light. Divisionism is a variant of pointillism that's completely focused on color theory. Interesting, it turns out that the concept of pointillism is used in many other ways of displaying color. For example, cyan, magenta, yellow, and key black's color printing process is dot-based. Television and computer monitors use a pointillist method to represent an image with the RGB guns and the color RGB color mod. Bendet dots uses a printing process of color dots widely spaced or closely spaced or overlapping to create optical illusions. This is often seen in comic books. The illustrator Benjamin Day developed the method for use in comic books. The artist Roy Lichtenstein enlarged and exaggerated the method in his modern artwork. This is a study that I did a number of years ago in my efforts to try to understand a little bit about how pointillism works. Fauvism is a strong color emphasized over representational or realism. It was a very short-lived movement from 1905 to 1907. Henri Matisse is probably one of the more leading artists. And we show a picture here of a woman with a hat, an oil painting creating in 1905. It's a grouping of artists that call themselves the Wild Beast because of the bold color strokes that they used. If we look closely at this image, we see that Matisse is not interested in emphasizing the true colors of the woman's face, but rather uses green, orange and yellow tones. Notice how he's using complementary tones between green and pink to emphasize various sections of her face. If you also look at the background of the painting, you will see he's using heavily complementary colors between green and magenta and violet and yellow. Now let's talk about a modern art movement called color field painting. This is where large amounts of flat, solid color are spread across a canvas. Very often in color field painting, there's no mixing of pigments. Rather, the paints are bought in the store, brought and painted directly onto the canvas. It was an abstract expressionist movement that emerged in the 1940s, continued into the 1950s and 60s. Some of the leading artists, Kenneth Nolan, Gene Davis, Ellsworth Kelly, Helen Frankenthaler, Ann Truitt, Jack Bush, and Frank Stella. Here we show an image of Frank Stella's. It's called Ragatuk, and it was created in 1970. Notice how he's distinctly painted these colors so they don't overlap with each other, but they create a harmonious tone in the relationship. Large canvas of pure color created areas of unbroken surface, flat picture plane. It's still an active painting style today. Now let's highlight some of the Bauhaus teachings of color theory. The Bauhaus was a school in Germany that pioneered many concepts in the teaching of design. It operated between 1919 to 1933 Many of the instructors continued developing their teacher teachings after 1933. 
Examples of instructors. Paul Clay. Kandinsky. Eitan. Albers. Now notice, some of these artists wrote prolifically about what their color theories were about. Kandinsky published, for lack of a better term, a technical paper on concerning the spiritual in art. It was in this paper will he define cool and warm colors, and we still use these concepts today. Eitan went on to develop his rationale for color theory, defined a lot to do with uh, the color wheel, developed, showed a lot of relationships in contrasting color tones that are still popular today. And Albers developed his book called The Interaction of Color, which is still used in a lot of teaching of de in the design of color. Let's specifically focus on Albers' work. You can see he was very precursor, actually, to color field painting. And many of Albers' students actually became pioneers in color field painting such as Kenneth Nolan. Albers was German-born, but became an American artist and educator. He taught at the Bauhaus, and he immigrated to the United States to teach at Black Mountain College and Yale University. He and his wife, Annie Albers, pioneered many concepts in design theory. He created color studies entitled Homage to the Square, which is a 25 period starting 25 year period starting in 1950 where he painted squares and showed the relationship between color among them in 1963 he published the interaction of color theory detailing his color theories and various teaching methods for it now let's do our first case study of applying our color theory knowledge to painting. We're going to look at the Sherwin-Williams Color Snap mobile app. We're going to take a digital collage that I did a while back called Beach Footprints and we're going to analyze three colors that are in that presentation. Sherwin-Williams is going to tell us what the three paints are that correspond to those colors. We're going to save it as beach, and it becomes one of our custom palettes. The thing to remember here, as Sherwin Williams tells you in the middle image that we show, that what you see on the screen is RGB color space. However, what you will paint on a wall is red, yellow, blue color space. So there will be differences. Now let's look at the My Pantone app and do a study of contrasting colors. Okay, let's look at beach footprints again. Now automatically the My Pantone app will extract colors and give specific values as its first step in analyzing a given digital image. If we don't like those values, we can select and create our own by brushing across the digital image. So here we're going to come up with three values. We think that the orange and the blue are complementary, and the gray is sort of a neutral tone. And that's the color uh, and a dominant color in our image. So those are our three colors. We now have the Pantone values of those three colors. But now we're going to delve a little bit further with the My Pantone app and look at harmonies. And we're going to look at this actual orange color and you're going to see when we look at harmonies, um, it, the My Pantone app tells you analogous, split, complementary, triadic, and it says you complementary. Now notice for this particular orange value, it says a turquoise is more complementary than the one that I chose. And the same is true if we go down and we look at the actual blue color that I chose. You'll see that sort of a um, orange yellow is more complementary. The grays kind of uh, equalize each other. However, I like the fact of the orange and blue complementary set, and so I've left it. But this um, My Pantone app provides you suggestions.
Now let's look at case study one, colorizing household, household broadband availability. Now I tell you, the student who worked with me on the project, on this project, which was done at the Renaissance Computing Institute in North Carolina State University when I was the director of that center, I told the student that we were going to do this color scheme based on the work in the colors of Kandinsky. Now he did not know much about Kandinsky. He was very much interested in engineering and computer science. But he read about it a great deal and later told me that he went to the New York Museum of Modern Art to sort of see the Kandinsky work, which was um, that he had had to learn so much from me. But anyway, we will um, discuss how we use, um, in Kandinsky's work, he liked to contrast color again to emphasize geometric shape. We could also achieve the same or a very similar color scheme by using the Color Brewer tool, which was developed by Cynthia Brewer at Pennsylvania State University. And here we show an example of Color Brewer tool in a color scheme. It's called a diverging color scheme. It matches very closely to our example. With color brewers, sequential color schemes are optimized for ordered data from low to high, while diverging color schemes place equal emphasis on the mid-range critical values as well as extreme values. Qualitative schemes do not imply magnitude differences and are suited for representing nominal or categorical data. So we're using a diverging color scheme. Now let's use the color brewer to a uh, color Adobe's cooler tool, excuse me. Let's use Adobe's cooler tool to analyze the colors in our broadband availability visualization. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to import the visualization into Adobe's cooler tool. We're going to use the five sensors to place them on the different colors, and we're going to see what color scheme evolves. And here we evolve a blue to an orange color scheme. Now let's look at the color wheel Adobe provides us and analyze the values in the color relationships. If we look careful, we do see the complementary color scheme of the blue and the orange. We also see an analogous color scheme. That would be four colors very adjacent to each other on the color wheel. And if we look below, that is the green through the orange range. So then what we have is we have an analogous color grouping with this blue hanging out there, kind of complementary to all three. That yields an accented analogous color scheme. And that is what this visualization is. It's an accented analogous color scheme. <clears throat> now let's talk about case study number two. Here we're going to talk about colorizing a hurricane, an animated sequence. This is based on Hurricane Katrina and a model of it, which is a two-kilometer grid resolution using the Weather Research Forecast Model, WRF. The animation shows rain isosurface with purple areas be locating of the heaviest rainfall. Dark blue areas are land masses. The orange values are the wind vectors. Here we're going to highlight three topics, applying color theory to a time series animation, using Adobe Cooler to analyze the color scheme, and working with Color Brewer to build the tropical storm animation color scheme. So now let's analyze the color scheme with Adobe's Cooler tool. So we're going to take a frame from the Hurricane Katrina visualization and move it in to Adobe's Cooler tool. And we're going to put our sensors on five different color elements in the visualization. 
Now let's look at it on the color wheel a little more closely. We see a complementary range. Again, that is the blue and the orange. That's very important because we want that complementary color scheme to exist so that the wind vectors will stand out all through the animation. We have an analogous grouping, which is the purple tones with the blue tones. tones. So that means what we put is we put the purple against a blue background, and we want that 3D rain isosurface to evolve in a way that's very pleasing for us to view and to look at. Now we have this outlying red color showing here. Now what that color is actually is a combination in the animation as it is evolving of purple and orange together will actually produce red. So it's actually an implementation of color theory but it's coming in by one because this is a snapshot of one frame of the animation. The mixing is occurring as the animation evolves. Key elements of our color map design. Establish color maps based on the flow of the animation sequence rather than the static image display. Now, Color Brewer is a static image display. It helps to mock up color maps. So we need to figure out what the Color Brewer values are and how to translate them into a visualization and animation tool. So here is the Color Brewer tool that was used to develop this animation. You'll see I was using Color Brewer before the version 2.0 came out. This is Color Brewer 1.0, but I've included it here so you can see the actual um, system that I was, color system I was working with. But what we've got is a diverging color scheme. And now we're going to put it into the animation sequence. Now to do that, we don't, we want this color scheme to be achieved as the animation develops. So we actually want to choose color maps that are different but will build this final color sequence. So what we're doing is we're combining orange tones, blue tones, and magenta tones. The orange tones are our wind vectors. The blue and the magenta tones are going to per produce the strong purple colors of the 3D surface, of uh, isosurfaces. So if we do a color scheme analysis of a hurricane, we can do this with Color Schemer Designer. Um, what we have is we have, again, the analogous colors of purple magenta and blue together and we have that dueling with a complementary color scheme of blue and orange to let the wind vector stand out. So here is a snapshot of the nonlinear editing system where we produce the uh, time series animation or the movie. I have some difficulties running this movie in Keynote and recording a an, um, soundtrack um, as well as recording my audio onto this um, presentation. So I won't be able to run the animation as it stands, but I hope you'll take my word for the fact that color mixing was achieved. Now let's look at another case study on visualizing correlation of molecular biological data. This is some work I've done with the University of Utah Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute. We have tiled scatter plot displays with complementary color schemes. And we're trying to coordinate patterns and correlation in the biological data.
Our key issue is selecting a complementary color scheme with Adobe's Cooler tool. But verifying color visualization concerns with VizCheck. And the color vision, vision concerns are color deficiencies that individuals may have in, in viewing the complementary colors and not necessarily seeing the relationship we're trying to achieve in the visualization. We're also going to cover a HueView mobile app that is designed for looking at color deficiencies as well and is available on your mobile device. So let's begin our testing of complementary color schemes. In the field of biology, there are two well-accepted color schemes. One of them is blue and yellow. Another one is green and red. These color schemes are complementary and the colors are opposite each other in the color wheel. And there's high contrast. Unfortunately, if you have a color deficiency, you might be colorblind, you would not be able to see the contrast that we're trying to achieve in this visualization. So we're going to use a tool called VizCheck that allows us to see what individuals with a color vision weakness, deuterotopy, protonopy, and tridenopy are the three most popular ones. We're going to use this check to evaluate our visualization results. Here we're going to show you red-green color scheme. Now it turns out that if you have a red-green color blindness, deuteronopy or protonopy, you will see that these tones transfer into a brownish simulation and the contrast is not that high and some of the data is very difficult to see. So this probably is not the best color scheme to use. Now if we're doing a blue and yellow color scheme analysis, it turns out with VizCheck simulations that it's also difficult to see the differences in patterns, especially if you have tritinopy. So as we were doing this work, we said to ourselves, okay, then let's forget about complementary colors for a second and try something like red and blue. So we tried that particular color scheme. And while there are differences, we found there to not to be enough contrast in the data display of a blue-red color scheme. So we tried something different. We tried a green-purple, which is also a complementary color scheme. And we found that there was enough contrast to address the color vision weaknesses, and the data also was displayed well. So this was the color scheme that we chose. Now let's look at a tool called HueView. It's an app for approximating color vision studies. This particular app is available on mobile devices, specifically on the iPhone, iPod Touch, and iPad. And as you can see, it is a lot like VizCheck. It can bring in an image and provide you the color blindness and color vision weaknesses.
So let's hue, let's hue, hue, let us use hue view on our red, on our, let us use hue view on our purple and green visualization and you can see the current the results. This was done on an iPad. Now let's move on to case study number four, colorizing a supernova. This visualization is based on astrophysics data by of a supernova shock wave. The actual 3D renderings used the InSight visualization software. We're going to highlight building the analogous and complementary color schemes with Color Scheme Designer. And we're going to analyze the existing color scheme with Adobe's Cooler tool. So analogous colors, again, are adjacent to each other on the color wheel. So if we use Color Scheme Designer, which is a web reference tool, we can come up with three analogous colors, green, blue, and yellow. Actually, actually, it would be yellow, green, and blue. And that clearly is a key factor in our visualization of the supernova. However, we have some data that we that is along the edge of the supernova and on the inside inner ring of the supernova that we want to emphasize. In order to emphasize that, we're going to build a complementary color scheme using the yellow and violet tones. As you can see, these two colors are complementary, opposite each other on the color wheel. So what happens is if you look carefully at this visualization is we have the analogous color range presenting most of the supernova data, but a very fine super violet range on the edge and in the inner circle showing this, this outlying data set. Now let's analyze this with Adobe's Cooler tool. Suppose we want to see what the actual cool values that Cooler tells us exist in the visualization. Here is the footprint. We see the complementary color range, the violet and the yellow, and then we see the analogous color range. So we verify that these two do indeed exist together. Now let's look and explore with our hands-on workshop of some online color tools. Adobe's Cooler Tool, Color Scheme Designer, Color Brewer. We'll also highlight Color Scheme or Touch, which is an um, app available for the iPad, the iPhone, and the iPod Touch. In this particular example, we're going to use an air pollution visualization. It's a computational model run. And it's ozone and NOx. They're two air pollutants that are actually opposites of each other. If you can call them complementary in a sense. So when NOx values are high, ozone values are low, and vice versa. In this visualization, you will see the orange elements, those are NOx, creates shadows effect on the ozone plate underneath it that's in blue. As you can see, the data does this. This is not an artistic effect. This is the relationship between the data. But we're going to use color theory to emphasize the values in the visualization. So, in using Adobe's Cooler tool to evaluate the colors in this visualization, we need an establish an account with Adobe and log into Adobe Cooler. Select the Create option. Move our five sensors to the various colors in the visualization. Establish our color palette. 
and name and save the color palette. So let's see what our visual results are. We have a blue, green, yellow, and orange range. If we analyze these values on a color wheel, we see we have a complementary set. That again is our yellow and our blue. Do we have analogous or do we have triad as we look at these values? Actually, we have tetrad, two complementary color sets. Adobe's cooler tool isn't going to let us see that very easily on this color wheel. So we're going to try another tool. We're going to use Color Scheme Designer. Let's go to the Color Scheme Designer site. Remember, this is a reference tool. And we need to select the Tetrad color scheme and establish our color options. Now we learned doing the Adobe Cooler analysis that our colors were orange, yellow, blue, and green. We already know what the colors are. So maybe our reference tool can help tell us what the color scheme is. If we look at the Tetrad color scheme, we will see that orange and green values produce a complementary pair, and that yellow and deep blue values produce, gold and yellow and deep blue values produce another complementary pair. So what we actually have is a tetrad, two complementary pair visualization. And color scheme designer gives you the hex triplet parameters of these colors. We could have also done this visualization. Now, I did it in the 1990s before Color Brewer existed as a tool. But we could have also done this from Color Brewer, where we go to the website, we select the data classes, which is four. We establish the nature of our data, which is diverging. And we determine a color scheme that we'd like to use. So now let's work with Color Brewer. If we look at Color Brewer, we will achieve, we will obtain the red, green, orange, and blue colors as diverging colors. You'll also notice in Color Brewer, it also develops colorblind safe maps, and this is a colorblind safe map as well. I have kept the borders and the roads in because in this actual visualization, we have two uh, white and black boundaries. Now let's use Color Scheme or Touch on our mobile devices to analyze this particular color scheme in the visualization. Color Scheme or Touch is a very powerful tool for these types of analyses. So this would mean you'd bring the visualization into your iPad or iPod or iPhone and what you would do is you would check the values and establish and create the color palette. So here we have the Nox Ozone color palette. Again we've got our blues, our greens, our yellow, and our orange colors. Then when we check we see that we have a very similar plot out of analogous colors with some complementary pairs. Now let's work with just a general digital media example. We'll look at Adobe's Cooler Tool and Color Scheme Designer as, color, as well as Color Scheme or Touch. Color Scheme or Touch, by the way, is a free app. Using Adobe's Cooler Tool, we're going to again log into Cooler, use the Create option, bring our rows in as a digital image, and put five sensors across it to determine the colors scheme of our rows. Now when we do that, we select our various colors, and what we get 
is a red to light orange range. This is a clear analogous color range, a very finely analogous color range. Now, we have an accent and analogous color, actually, if we put the green leaves, because the green would be um, complementary to the range. Notice, with Adobe Cooler, you get the HSV, RGB, CMYK, CIE Lab, and hex values. Now let's try Color Scheme Designer. Again, remember this is a reference tool, so we're not importing the image into Color Scheme Designer. We're comparing the image with the Color Scheme Designer references. So here, as we look at the example and we look at analogous, we see indeed we do have an analogous range from the red um, orange and magenta values. And this corresponds well with our digital image. Now we're going to use Color Scheme with Touch. Again, this what we would do is we get this app from the iTunes stores. We'd bring import our photo using Photo Schema the color scheme or touch, and we'd analyze the colors. So here now we're uh, on an iPod touch, and we're bringing in the image of the digital image of the rose. Now we're looking and we're establishing our color palette. We get the web hex values of our color palette, and we see that the Five colors are very closely located to each other. And what we have is a definitely an analogous color range. Now the power of this is this is a mobile app that you could have <clears throat> on your device at any time to analyze your digital media. Let's also add a look at another mobile app, My Pantone, and analyze our rows. Now this is a $9.99 sent app from the iTunes store and it automatically extracts colors as we covered before when you bring an image in and you brush over the, <clears throat> over the photo to select your colors and it provides you more details in your of your color spaces so now we're going to use the my Pantone app we're going to bring the rows in and we're going to notice that somewhere is spotted Somehow we have a blue tone in it. But we've analyzed this rose enough to know that we really don't want the blue tone in there. We might take some of the cream tones with it, the light, the light grayish tones. So we've got a orange, magenta, and a light gray tone that we've selected for this rose. We can look at the color harmonies to see what the contrasting values of the colors are. And we have the Pantone values of our image. Now let's look at, imagine that we have brought, and we have a digital image, and we would like to use the colors in it for some kind of um, painting situation, perhaps the walls in our apartment or in our home or we would like to use the Color Snap app from Sherwin Williams to know what colors that this digital image matches. So we're going to bring in our digital image. We're going to select a primary color, then a second and third color, and we're going to save the color palette. So here we are bringing in our image. And we select our first, a yellow orange is our primary. So that was the color stamp app, by the way. Then we also determine the um, red orange color and then the light orange color. 
we save it, and we find that we have papaya, heartfelt, and coral kicks is our Sherwin-Williams colors. We save that color scheme for future use in reference. In summary, we've highlighted five topics in our course. Additive and subtractive color models, defining color gamuts, spaces, and systems, selected artistic movements related to color theory, case studies pertaining to colorizing visualization, and our hands-on workshop using online color tools. Other resources on color theory. Maureen Stone has a recent book on a field guide to digital color that is a handy reference. The Interaction of Color by Joseph Albers is a classic. And my recently published book chapter attempts to look at color theories applied to digital media and visualization. I'd like to give a little acknowledgments. This course was presented at ACM SIGGRAPH 2012, and I'd like to thank the course reviewers and the committee for accepting my proposal. I'd like to thank all the people who attended that section, session in Los Angeles, and much gratitude to my colleagues in visualization and digital media over the many years who provided me with challenging opportunities. With much gratitude and appreciation, thank you. Here is the URL to my slides on YouTube. Again, thank you very much for listening to me today.